say goodbye to your credit card rewards. Greedy corporate mega stores, led by Walmart and Target, are pushing for a law in Congress to take away your hard-earned cash back and travel points to line their pockets. The Durbin Marshall Credit Card Bill would enact harmful credit card routing mandates that would end credit card rewards as we know it. If you love your credit card rewards, tell your lawmakers, hands off my rewards. Tell them to oppose the Durbin Marshall Credit Card Bill. This week's podcast is brought to you by The Great Courses. I love learning. That's why I'm a big fan of The Great Courses. These are video and audio lecture series taught by top professors and experts. And they recently sent me Mysteries of Modern Physics, Time. Hosted by physicist Sean Carroll, author and professor from Caltech, and you may remember him from a Story Collider podcast earlier this year about how he turned down jobs from Stephen Hawking. Twice. If you're curious about the science Sean does, this course is perfect for that. He covers what we know about what time is, how the era of time works, all that good stuff. You can check this lecture and others out, too, with a special offer. Order from up to eight of their best-selling courses, including Sean Carroll's, at up to 80% off the original price for a limited time. So order today. Go to thegreatcourses.com slash stories. That's thegreatcourses.com slash stories. A science story, huh? These NYU scientists, they I felt, felt, felt I right. Right. And I, I was so and I just thought, well, I had figured it, out. I it was that oh. golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true personal stories about science. We have shows coming up December 9th in New York City and December 1st and 16th in Boston. StoryCollider.org for more. This week's story is from Adam Rogers, who was recorded in October 2015 at the Rickshaw Stop in San Francisco as part of the Bay Area Science Festival. Uh, At the end of my sophomore year of college, uh, it was clear to almost everyone but me that I was not going to be a scientist. Um, I was uh, was destined to be a typist, uh, to write. But but I still didn't know that myself. And with the end of the year approaching, I didn't have a job for the summer. And one of my biology professors, a guy named Bruce Telzer, offered me a job. He said that he would uh, have me come work for him in his lab that he had every summer at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole on Cape Cod. Yeah, we've heard of it. Um, so I said, yeah, uh, I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't have the job. He, I think, knew um, that I, if I wasn't going to be a scientist, if I was going to be a journalist, which is what it was looking like increasingly, that he wanted me to at least see what a lab was like one time. So uh, so I got on a plane. I went to uh, Massachusetts. I got there. Um, he was studying intracellular motility. So he was trying to figure out how things move around inside cells. It turns out there's a network of microtubules. It's like a transit system inside a cell that all of the different organelles inside a cell and the vesicles full of food move around inside. And he was trying to understand how that worked. Uh, in order to do that, he had a, this amazing... I got to his lab and saw this, this amazing uh, microscope array that was like four feet high from the table, had cameras on top of it, all kinds of different lights and filters, and he was, uh, he, uh, and he would connect, he had this connected to a, a videotape recorder. There weren't computers yet, that's how old I am. Um, and he, uh, so he, he was just hoping <laughs> that he would catch in the act something landing on a microtubule, and he would be able to film it. Because the, the, a device that, I guess now is called the laser tweezers, that had not been invented yet. So uh, he couldn't move these microscopic um, elements of cells around, we had to wait. Um, so I got to the lab and uh, quickly showed an in- a complete lack of talent uh, at anything in a lab, including dishwashing. I broke labware uh, left and right, um, which put me on a, on a singular duty in the lab. He, I got a lot of eye rolls for not being able to figure out any other science except this. Um, I was assigned the responsibility of harvesting gametes. So you, you know what a gamete is, right? So that's sperm or eggs. 
Um, the Marine Biological Laboratory is an interesting place because it, they, they do some ocean research, but it's not all ocean research. It's a lot of biology. What they're really good at is acquiring research animals. Basically, the entire fishery of the Northeast is theirs to pull in uh, animals that you can study in the lab. So uh, squid, giant, giant optic nerves from squid or um, blood from horseshoe crabs, or in our case, gametes from, among other things, surf clams. So surf clams are the, uh, the clams that are in like Campbell's clam chowder. And it's a wonder that this actually did not put me off clam chowder, but it should have. Um, I learned a few things about clams very quickly. The first thing is when you take the clam out of the aquarium and put it in your plastic bucket, you want to take it out with the flat side facing you because they're defensive little critters. They, they close up their shell when they're scared. And then they, they, if you have them blade side, they squirt water out of the siphon, which then goes onto your shirt and all down your pants which is a good, if one of them does that to you, then you know you're going to kill that little fucker first. That guy, <laughs> he's getting harvested. That little son of a bitch. And you take those, so you take the clams up to the lab, and basically you shuck them. It's the same thing as you would see if you're going to eat clams. You shove a knife into the siphon, and you twist it, you do it to the other side, you break the muscle that holds the shell closed, it opens. If they're male, there's a big organ like a sac, you sort of cut that open, and the sperm looks exactly like you think it does. Um, uh, with uh, with the female clams, it's, it's sort of more pinkish and granular. Um, it looks, uh, you can sort of tell the difference. Sexing clams. I got good at sexing clams. You don't want the one gook to touch the other gook because when a when a mommy clam and a daddy clam love each other very much, you know, they're, they're, right? You want to avoid that in the lab because you're trying to collect these. You're trying to harvest the gametes. You're trying to collect the gametes. So I worked with the with the clams a lot. But that wasn't our only study animal. We were also working with sea urchins, uni. Sushi fans, uni. Sea urchins are different. So I'd go down to the collection aquaria, take 20 sea urchins, put them in the bucket, take them upstairs. Um, the first thing that started to happen to me was when I, I picked them up and I would ask Bruce, is it when you, when you hold a sea urchin, are, you supp are your fingers supposed to get kind of tingly and numb? Is that supposed to happen? and I would get the eye roll. It turns out that sea urchins have a little bit of venom in their spines, to which I was allergic. Again, very effective lab assistant. <laughs> so I would wear gloves. I had to wear gloves for the whole time. Harvesting gametes, uh, I'm gonna use that euphemism, masturbating sea urchins is a little different. <laughs> Here's how this works, in case you ever need to do it. Here's how it works. You take the sea urchin, you get a hypodermic needle full of potassium chloride solution. In the, there's a little ring sort of around the top, which is about where a good sushi chef will cut the uni open and serve it to you. Instead of cutting it open and eating it, what you do is you take the hypodermic needle, you plunge it in there about half an inch, you squirt about half a mil of potassium chloride solution, which the ions are in solution in, this, uh, in the liquid. They go into the body, and they basically fuck up every cell. <laughs> in that sea urchin. It's essentially like administering a liquid electric shock. When sea urchins mate in the ocean, they, they just sort of squirt their gametes into the, into the water and they kind of float. There's no dating. Sea urchins don't date. They, just, they, they squirt the gametes in the water. If the gametes meet, then you get baby sea urchins. Um, if you have a male not in the water, then the first thing that happens after you hit them with the potassium chloride is all those little those little spikes on the outside of the sea urchin, they all start, they sort of start to wave. They can wave around, it's really creepy. Uh, and, then this, uh, and then this like white ooze comes out of the top of the sea urchin, which then you collect with another hypodermic um, syringe. Uh, if they're female, it's not white, it's purple. It's like this purple jelly looking stuff. Very quickly, my pants were covered in purple stains, <laughs> which I had to explain as being like grape jelly to friends, because how do you, what are you going to say at that point? What is that? Just, I don't even want to talk about it. Uh, and again, you want to keep these things separate. Now, so the whole point of this was that we're going to use the, 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 the ova. We're going to use the eggs um, to get sort of the material out from the inside of the egg, and that's what's going to land on top of a microtubule. We have to get the microtubules. So that's the tail of the sperm. You have to get the tail off the sperm. Here's how that worked. Uh, there was a lab, piece of lab equipment called a homogenizer. A homogenizer is a, uh, it's about, it's a glass cylinder, about that long, with kind of rounded end, and like a ball right there. So you, you get the picture, it's like a glass cylinder with a rounded end and a ball right there, about three quarters. Are you getting what this looks like? 
you put the um, like in solution the the male gametes into the bottom of this thing, and then there's like a glass plunger machined, milled to a very tight tolerance. So it just it, it like grinds right up against the walls of this thing, and you basically kind of do this with it for a little while. This is my this is my life in the lab. Um, <laughs> With Bruce explaining to me, like, well, you want to just sort of keep doing that, and you'll notice it has a kind of honey-like consistency. And his wife, uh, his wife was a researcher at the MBL. They shared a lab together, and his wife heard that she didn't talk much. She, I was a, a huge failure in her eyes, too. But she heard that, and I just heard her snort, and she just turned around and said, oh, Bruce, come on, it's not honey-like, it's snot. Thanks. So, okay. So I would, um, I would hit the, the uh, sea urchins with the potassium chloride, and, uh, and they'd start to wave like this, and then they would e ejaculate. And uh, so I finally asked, you, so Bruce, what, what happens to the sea urchin? Like, how do they experience this? Are they, you know, is that, does, does the waving mean they're having fun, or are they, am I? <laughs> and he said, I don't know, you're probably killing them, right? And I said, I, I, am I? I don't, the clams, it was obvious, you know, you rip those open, but the, are they going to, and he said, how would you know? I mean, what, they don't have a sophisticated nervous system, they don't, I mean, how would you, what, he, he was throwing them away, he said, listen, I tell you what, at the end of the day, if you're really worried about it, you can put the sea urchins back in your bucket, you can take them down to the beach, to the seawall, and you can dump them back in the water, would that make you feel better? So, dutifully, at the end of every day, I would take these sea urchins, <laughs> these spent sea urchins, down to the to the seawall and pour them out into the shallows outside the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, which is across the street from the MBL, and look into the water and see if they were okay, if they were moving around. Um, I don't think they were okay. <laughs> in retrospect, I don't think they were. Uh, <laughs> so. Um, uh, so near the end of the time I was spending in Bruce's lab, um, despite our best efforts, I can't remember if he did this on purpose to look at it to show me or not, honestly. Uh, but th we, he had a, um, a, a, I think it was a clam, t a male a sperm and an egg come into contact on a microscope slide. And he knew that it happened. He must have done it on purpose because he knew it happened. He put a cover slide on it, put it into the cool giant microscope thing, turned a bunch of switches and dials, and turned on the screen, and then so he, and centered it on the screen, and we watched uh, this, the, the egg, get that fissure down the side, and then split into two, and then split into four, and then go to eight. I think, he I think we took it to 16. Uh, and, then, and then he, uh, did I do that math right? I did that math right, didn't I? Um, until he either until he washed the slide, put it in the biologicals, and that was it. And I was awestruck. So I had seen, you know, like the movies about where babies come from and stuff. I wasn't, I, I was not unfamiliar with how this worked, you know, but I never watched it live. And I was just astonished at how amazing that thing that was happening on the screen was. And he, you know, he saw it in, in my face too. Um, and I, so, I know what this sounds like. So I'll, I'll stipulate a few things. First of all, you're not going to find many people more secular than me. Uh, second, I firmly believe in animal research. This is how you do science. Third, I believe women have the right to an abortion. This is not what I'm talking about. But when I was watching that happen on that screen, I was convinced that I was watching a miracle. I don't say that word lightly. I know scientists, good scientists, see that and feel it all the time. It's what makes them good scientists, that they can channel that love for what they are seeing in the universe into their work. But man, watching it completely broke me for lab work. And Bruce looked at me, didn't give me the eye roll, but saw what had happened in my head and said, hit the beach, you're done. And I went outside and got a tan. <laughs> Thank you. That was Adam Rogers. 
Adam is an articles editor at Wired, where he edits features about miscellaneous geekery and runs the science desk. His features for the print magazine have included stories about the astrophysics of the movie Interstellar, a fan cruise for Apex Nerds, and a mysterious fungus that lives on whiskey fumes. The last one won the 2011 AAAS Kavli Science Journalism Award for magazine writing and led to Roger's New York Times bestselling book, Proof, The Science of Booze. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Weck, Darren Barker, Ari Daniel, Christine Gentry, Skylar Bear, and Liz Neely. The podcast is produced by Rose Eveleth. Additional help from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, and Justin D'Ambrugio. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to the Rickshaw Stomp for hosting the show, to Kishore Hari and everyone at the Bay Area Science Festival for incredible help, and to Marine Laboratories for finding so much stuff in salt water. Thanks for listening. Say goodbye to your credit card rewards. Greedy corporate mega stores, led by Walmart and Target, are pushing for a law in Congress to take away your hard earned cash back and travel points to line their pockets. The Durbin Marshall Credit Card Bill would enact harmful credit card routing mandates that would end credit card rewards as we know it. If you love your credit card rewards, tell your lawmakers hands off my rewards. Tell them to oppose the Durbin Marshall Credit Card Bill. <laughs> 